Hey there, welcome back to INST 314 Statistics for Information Science with Sean Jansen. We're going to do the last of our uh, slide videos for the chi square test of independence now, focusing on 6.3, interpreting the differences of the chi square test of independence. In previous videos, we went ahead and recapped the chi square basics and the goodness of fit. We differentiated it from the goodness of a test to the test of independence, and I showed you how to find expected frequencies. Other videos are going to be looking at the chi-square analysis in Excel and confirming our results with uh, R. This particular video, though, is going to be looking specifically at effect size and power testing of the chi-square. So let's go ahead and start on interpreting the differences. The chi-square test, as we were saying before, is that it tells us if your variables are independent or not with the test for independence. It kind of goes in the name. However, what it doesn't tell us is anything about the pattern or the nature of that relationship. In order to figure out something about its relationship or the pattern, to see where some sizes may be larger or smaller than others, it helps if we can compute our frequencies into percentages and compare across, depending if it's the rows or the columns, to go ahead and see where the distributions fall, which groups are larger or smaller relative to the others. Now I want to note that this is what we call an unstandardized effect size. We have other effect sizes we're going to look at that are standardized. So in this case, as we observe these percentages, it's relative to the other values in the distribution, but we could not compare it to other chi-square results from other analyses. Now going back to look at our example on the internships to work from the previous lecture video, we had said that internships did not lead, they were not statistically significant, so we wouldn't be able to draw conclusions up to the population. But I still want to show these just as an interesting pattern so we can talk about it relative to the sample. We can't generalize to the population, but we can still talk about it to the sample. And since we're already familiar with the example, it works in, for what we're doing here. Now, generally speaking, what you want to do is sum across the rows of the columns depending on where your independent variable is at. In this case, internships was our independent variable, and it's in the columns. So I went ahead and did a column percentage making the columns sum to 100%. Don't worry about the rows sum to, only worry about where you're summing across for your independent variable. And so what we see is that if we add up 5, 3, and 8 for the yes internship column, they add sum to 16, and if you take each of those, 5 out of 16 is about 31.3%, 3 out of 16 is about 18.8%, 8 out of 16 is 15%, and the similar for the no internship column. If we happen to have our data restructured such that our independent variable for the internships was in the rows, we would do the exact same thing, but we would do a row percentage, and the percentages would be equivalent to what we saw on the other screen, because all we're doing is transposing the table. So if we went ahead and broke this out, in this case I'm only showing the yes internship because that's what we were interested in the most, was between if a student had an internship and made these differences. And because we only had of two possible answers, yes or no, the no response is going to be uh, similar to what we'd see with the yes response because it's uh, that just a yes and no portion. So as we break this out, we can see that those who did not confirm at 31%, unsure 19, and 50% said yes. So looking at this, we can say that more than twice as many confirmed in their interest compared to those who were unsure. It was more than double. And uh, quite a bit larger, almost 19% larger here of those that said yes compared to those that said no. This is a way of getting at the difference, the impact of these sorts of things when we're looking at these distributions. And keep in mind, you're always going to try and make your images presentation quality or PQ. The chart that is in here was made in Excel, but you could do it in Excel or R or whatever visual platform it is you want to work on. Just make sure you're not giving these sort of raw uh, graphics that might come out of systems like R without cleaning them up a little bit first. Let's go ahead and talk about uh, standardized effect sizes and power. So we said before that there were unstandardized and standardized. The unstandardized were where we were looking at with the percentages. And when we talk about the standardized, these are numerical values that will allow us to compare our chi-square effect size result to other chi-square results of the same type. And so this is just a single number that we use to capture the strength of the association in the table. It doesn't speak to how much the variables are related or not related. It doesn't say what parts of them are going to be stronger or less than other parts of the distribution. That's what we use the unstandardized effects for. So in this case, 
it's just going to go ahead and say of the table overall, what is the strength of this association? And keep in mind, the two estimates we're about to give you, they're affected by things like sample size as well as the actual strength of the relationship. And the two that we're going to look at are called phi and Kramer's V. Now phi, it's pronounced phi, but if you want to call it phi, that's okay by me. We only use it for two by two tables. And it's symbolized by Greek letters for phi upper and phi lower are fine, where it sort of looks like an O with a vertical line through it. Kramer's V, we can just colloquially call it V if you want, but it's Kramer's V, are used for all other bivariate tables larger than 2.2. And you may see it expressed, depending where you go, looking like a phi with a C next to it. I won't use that in this course, but I want to at least show it to you in case you happen to come across it on the internet or somewhere else. Now, looking at phi and Kramer's V, both of them take into account the sample size. They're both sensitive to changes in the marginal distributions. What do we mean by marginal distributions? We're talking about the spread of the frequencies across the table as it affects the marginal rows and the marginal columns. And it's not particularly sensitive as to which variables are in rows or columns. That It's universal for that. And so the formula for both of these, phi takes the chi-square critical value, I'm sorry, not critical value, it takes the chi-square obtained value, we divide it by the sample size, and then we take the square root. Whereas Kramer's V is very similar, but we're including a degree of freedom component to help control for the size of the table. So we start with the chi-square obtained value, and we divide it by the sample size times dfk min, meaning the degrees of freedom with k minus 1 minimum, where k minus 1 is the smaller number of rows or categories. Okay, we'll see an example of this in just a moment. And then we take the square root of that to give us our v. So if I had, just for example, a chi-square value of 12.2 with an n of 24, our phi would be 0 0.7129. 12.2 divided by 24 square root equals 0 0.7129. If I had a 3 by 4 table with a chi-square value of 21.8, an n of 52, and in my 3 by 4 table, 3 has the smaller number of rows compared to 4, so we have k minus 1, where k is the smaller number, the rows of 3, minus 1 gives us a df k min of 2. Plugging that into the Kramer's V formula, we have our chi-square critical value of 21.8, divided by our n of 52 times the df k min of 2, square root gives us a Kramer's V value of 0 0.4578. Now, when we want to interpret these particular values, we just use a general rule of thumb. This is, again, not a hard and fast rule. And I call this the scientific french fry size. We have small, medium, and large. Our small value is 0.1, medium is 0.3, and large is 0.5. Compare the phi or the Kramer's V that you got compared to our french fry size here and figure out if we are small, medium, or large. So in R, if we're going to go ahead and do these, we're going to use a package called desk tools capital D-E-S-C, capital T-O-O-L-S. Run the library to activate it, and then we get access to the fee with a capital P and the Kramer V. Note it's Kramer, not Kramer's, with capital C and capital V. If you have problems with some of these, come let me know. There may be some alternate packages I can help to get you with this. And if we go ahead and compare back, using the student internship data, we would see that we have a medium effect size. I could use the desk tools function to ask for the Kramer V formula. I've saved it on a variable called intern. This is all in the R walkthrough video. And we get a value of 0 0.275. This is a Kramer V because we did not have a 2 by 2 table. And just as well, if we would have done this by hand with the calculator, we could do a square root of the chi-square value we had of 2.49 divided by our n of 33 times 1 of our df came in gave us a by hand number of two, zero, 0 0.271 and so on. And so these values are very close to each other, given the fact that one was done by R and one was just done with basic calculator. Now when we want to go into the power testing, keep in mind our definition for power. Power is the probability that we're going to find a particular effect in our test when that effect is real or not find one when there's no effect. All right, so it's that probability that we're going to be right based on whatever it is that we found. And you want to have, if you want to be taken credibly, a power of at least 0.8 or 80%, meaning you're going to find the right value 80% of the time. Now, 
it, we're looking to the power library, PWR, mentioned in the previous video. So we're going to activate the power, power package with the library function. And the specific function we're going to use for the chi-square is pwr.chisq.test, power chi-square test. And inside parentheses, we're going to specify a W, an N, capital N, by the way, DF, sig.level, and power, where W is the effect size, and we put in the size of the effect that we want to have in our power analysis. N is the total sample size in our analysis. DF are the degrees of freedom. Sig level is our alpha level, not the p-value, the alpha level. And power is the probability that we're going to want. Remember, greater, equal to or greater than 0.8. Now, when you're doing a power test, you only enter in four of the five values. Enter the fifth one as null, all caps, N-U-L-L, -L, null. When you run the test, it will give us back the four values we input plus the value we are missing of the fifth value. And it's sort of a way to help us figure out what our missing pieces might be in order to get the analysis that we need. So for example, if we wanted to use internship data, I would ask ourselves, what is it we need to plug in for W and DF SIG level and power? And we could go ahead and replace that. If we set our effect size, which we'd calculated just so to speak from the sample that we had of 0.275 was our medium effect. We had two degrees of freedom. We had an alpha of 0.05. And if I wanted to have a power of at least eight, that means if I want to be able to find a power of 0.8, given the effect size that we have, given the degrees of freedom and the significance level we have, we would need to have a sample of at least 128 students. That's what I was trying to find here is what is the end, the, the sample of students that we would need. And so our n value is 127.4. I'm rounding up because we don't count students as partial students. So I just rounded up to the next particular value rather than down to be conservative in our estimates. But just the same, if I was to say I had 50 students, I could have plugged in my same w, n equals 50, df of 2, sig of 0.05, and put power as null. And it would output for me and tell me what my power would be given a sample size of only 50 students and so on. And so with that, that concludes our video set on the chi-square test of independence with the other two videos doing the walkthrough in Excel and R. I'll see you in the next topic module.